Let's read Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 1 through 6. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 1 through 6. <coughs> It says again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchmen, if when he sees the sword come upon the land, he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whosoever hears the sound of the trumpet and takes not warning if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood is going to be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, and he took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that takes warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman sees the sword come and blows not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord God, that you'd be with us this morning. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence. You're the one that prepares the heart, Lord God, to receive the truth of the seed. Lord, I know that you always are, you're never, you never seek, Lord God, you never fail me, is what I'm trying to say. When I, when I come to present your word, I always feel your presence with me. But Lord, I'm asking you to anoint your word this morning, Lord, that it would be driven deep inside the hearts of your people. Lord God, that you would do what only you can do and that you would change all of our hearts, Lord God, and give us hope, Lord God, and life according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. So I titled this morning's message, A Word from a Watchman. You know, in this uh, Ezekiel passage, in verse 2 of chapter 33, in verse 2, the first part, it said, Son of man, speak to the children of your people. And he says, it's say unto them when I bring the sword upon the land. So I wanted you to see right there that, number one, it was God's people. He was talking to his own people. And then it was also, God said, I'm the one that's bringing the sword Upon the land. See, sometimes people don't understand why there's various things that take place in their life. As a matter of fact, sometimes you go to a church and all they ever have is something positive to say. I got something positive for you this morning. You serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He paid a redemption price. The prison doors have been opened. He set you at liberty, amen, and now you right. can come join the song of the redeemed. But listen to me. Each time and sometimes in our life, in certain days of our lives, it doesn't always seem that way. It seems like the sword has come upon the land. There's trials and there's tribulations in our lives. But listen, God wants you to know that he's the one that allows certain things to take place in your life. And the reason that he does it is for a purpose. God has a purpose for your life. Amen. And sometimes if you're like anything like me, you can't really see the purpose of God in your life till you go through some things, Amen. till you've been through some stuff. See, God knows how to orchestrate circumstances to get your eyes back on him. He loves you that much. As a matter of fact, some people might question, why in the world would he do that? We'll put Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 up there, and I'll explain it to you. Why God would allow circumstances to take place in your life. Because it says right here, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Yes. The word chasten there, I know I'm all into Greek words and stuff, and I'm not trying to confuse you, but the word is padia, and it comes where we get the word pediatrics from, because it describes the concept of training up a child. See, part of God allowing circumstances to take place in your life is how he chastens the ones whom he loves. Whom God loves, he chastens. That's why I will never buy into the modern concept that children don't need to be properly corrected and disciplined. No, true love is going to take the time. That's another story. That's a practical message. But true love is going to take the time to correct the child because the reality is, is that the child doesn't know what's best for them. Yes. I'm just being real with you. We don't know what's best for us. We need the Lord to reveal to us what's best for us. So that's why he might allow the sword to be brought into your land. Judgment is from the sword. Chastening is from the sword, but the Lord has a solution. Listen, in verse the second part of verse uh, 2 of chapter 33, it says this, if the people of the land will take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchmen. So God's people, God's chastening, but he wants his own people called by his name to choose a watchman for themselves. See, God expects his, that his people will find themselves a watchman. 
You might have met someone through your journey of Christianity that says, yeah, well, I love the Lord, but I don't go to church. And I don't have to go to church. Listen to me. That's direct contradiction to the Word of God. Amen. Whenever somebody starts to tell you that, I'm telling you right now, they're already preaching false doctrine to you. Amen. Okay, well, because the word of God says forsake not the gathering of the brethren. Amen. And let me tell you something. You can sit in there and you can watch the best preacher that did money that not money can buy because that ain't going to be a good preacher. But you can watch the best <laughs> preacher that you flip through the channels on TV. And guess what? While you're sitting there by yourself on that couch, you don't have nobody that you have to learn to deal with. Yeah. You ever been close to a family member that got on your nerves before? Amen. Come on, somebody. I'm out. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And sometimes it's hard to get along with family members. But when you really love a family member, what do you do? You learn how to humble yourself because that's your family. And you got you to gotta love your family. The same thing in the church. You're going to run into folks in the church. Listen, we're, we're really a small church. I thank God that it, it's, it's hey, grow. And if you show up every Sunday, it's going to look like it's getting more and more full. Like Praise God. Bring, a, bring somebody with you. Amen. But one of the things that I've learned since I've been in the church for so long, if you hang around long enough, somebody's going to hurt you. Somebody's going to do you wrong and you're going to be frustrated and you're not going to like to be around that person and you'd rather sit on your couch and watch some preacher on TV, but that's not the way God works. That's right. God uses people also to chasten you. That's right. To bring things out in you. You know, some people I appreciate, you know, like what I'm trying to say is, is that some people, they just speak a word and they get right to the point and, and sometimes it seems abrupt and it's rude. We got to be careful that we don't get abrupt and rude in certain people's lives just to do that. I don't know why I'm saying this, but I'm saying it. But at the same time, sometimes people are, that's the way God made people. And sometimes it's good not to cut, not to, 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 to skirt around the issue. Sometimes it's good to get right to the point. And one thing that I would encourage you to do is that if somebody says something to bring some correction in your life and it cuts you in the heart, before you get all mad at that person and think that they're rude, you might want to just stop and look in the mirror. And you might want to ask yourself, but is what that person said the truth? Come on. Is it possible that God needs to work on their delivery? <laughs> yeah. But that's not the issue. Is it possible that what they said to you was the truth? When you hang out in a family, in the church of God, with the people of God, guess what? Sometimes that kind of thing's going to happen and it's going to frustrate you. What are you going to do? Pack up your bags and go? Are you going to leave? Are you going to go find another, uh, what do you call it? A play, a sand lot to whatever you call it, sandbox. <laughs> sandbox to play in? No. Nah, not in the house of God. That doesn't have anything to do with my message. That was a little line out for you. <laughs> God expects that his people will find themselves a watchman. What I'm trying to say is, is that if you belong to God, you need a preacher that's going to tell you the truth. It doesn't have to be this preacher. But you need a preacher that will tell you the truth. You don't want some preacher that's going to tell you a bunch of stuff to make you feel good about yourself just because he wants you back next week so you put your money in the box. That's not the kind of preacher you want. That's a lying preacher. That's a preacher that's only worried about finances. What you want is a preacher that's willing to get into the word of God to be a watchman, to blow the trumpet, to sound the alarm, to give the warning and to let you know, hey, there might be a sword coming on the land. God might send some trial and tribulation in your life. But if you'll trust him and you'll keep your focus on him, he, he might chasten you. But he's going to grow you up because he loves you. And he wants to get you to the place where you need to go. Hallelujah. There's going to be a trial or a test coming. You need to get your preacher that's going to tell you the truth. Look at verses 4 and 5. It says, Then whoever hears the word of the trumpet and takes not warning if the sword comes up and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He who heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh the warning shall deliver his soul. You know, one of the beauties of the gospel teaches me that I got to get to the place in my walk with God that I don't just hear the word of the Lord anymore, but that I start to submit to the Hallelujah. word of the Lord. Hallelujah. I can't do it for myself. I can't make myself obedient. You can't put a shock collar on me like a dog and make me submit. I got to willingly submit to the Lord because God created us with a free will and he wants us to willingly submit to his will. It'd be easy if we could just put shot collars on each other and do it like that. It don't work that way. I need the Holy Spirit 
to put a spirit of obedience in me. I need the grace of the Lord to give me the strength that I need to humble myself in the presence of God, to desire to do the will of God in every single little aspect of my life. God ain't one little pieces of us. He wants the whole thing. Jesus gave the whole thing, gave his whole life, laid down his life, said it is finished. Jesus gave everything, and now he's asking us to give back. Amen. That's what it teaches, Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but he liveth in me. And now this life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The point is, is that Jesus died so that you and I could live. But the way that we live for him is that we die to him. So that true life can come right. forth. See, God can't use you till you're willing to die. He said, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies. He's talking about a seed. Unless a seed of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it would die, it would bear much fruit. He was talking about himself. He had to go to the cross. He had to die. Amen. But the result of that <laughs> produced a harvest. It's going to produce a harvest of humanity. You can come and join the song of of the redeemed. Yes, Amen. Hallelujah. But listen, if, if in verse 6, it also says this, but the watchman who sees the sword and he doesn't blow the trumpet, now the Lord's going to hold the watchman accountable. I can be honest with you and transparent to you and let you know that I have heard much of the word of God, but I have honestly not surrendered to every aspect of the word of God any more than you've surrendered to every aspect of the word of the Lord. But let me just tell you this one thing. Lord, I beg of you that you would allow me to be the kind of watchman that would always sound the trumpet, Lord God, so that the blood of your people that are called by your name would not be on my hands, but that instead your word would go forth, hallelujah, and that it would accomplish what you set it forth to do. Yes, Lord. So listen, I'm going to sound the alarm. That was just my intro. I'm going to sound the alarm this morning about two things that I want to talk to you about. All right, y'all ready? Here we go. Just two things. I've been preaching four points. This is just two. I think I'm going to get you out of here early today. We'll see. <laughs> Point number one. You ready? It's a long one. Here we go. The world has more to offer than you could ever consume. That's just the first part of the clause. The world has more to offer than you could ever consume. But what the world is offering will never satisfy oh, your soul. Amen. That's right. The world is offering more than you could ever consume, but what the world is offering will never. Hear me again. I wish that this place was full. I would like. I see fam, my own family members are missing from this place this morning. I don't even know if they would listen, but I wish they were here so that they could hear me say, "The world is offering more than you could ever consume, but what it's offering, you will never be satisfied with. It's gonna leave you empty. It's gonna leave you high. It's gonna leave you dry. It's gonna pick you up and it's gonna drop you." down and you're going to feel lower when it's done with you than you did when you first tapped into it. I'm telling you right now, don't tell me I'm not telling the truth. I'm preaching the truth. You've experienced it before. We need a revelation from the Holy Spirit to make it real to our heart that we would see, oh God, you're what I long for. But that's point number two. Let me just stick with point number one right now. You ready? <laughs> Proverbs chapter 30 verse 15 through 16. Boy, I, I always used to like this verse. Uh, but I like even more digging it out. This is one of the ones you just, for, you just read past it. Like, what in the world does that mean? It says the horse leech. That's the King James Version. Other translations just say plain old leech. The horse leech has two daughters, and this is what they cry. Give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied. Yes, four things say not it is enough. The grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire says not it is enough. The grave is always hungry for one more dead body. A fire wants to consume one more thing. The womb was meant to bear children. When it came, it's all it can think about. A leech has a thirst for blood that is never satisfied. And this is the way that sin acts in our lives. The leech only knows how to suck blood and take from another. Sin will do the same thing to a life. It will still and never stop. And once it's stuck itself to someone, it won't come off easily. And when you see it as ugly as it is, you know it's going to hurt to rip it off. But it's so ugly. Hmm. It's so ugly. I, mean, yeah, I was thinking about this because one time, see, my mama's people were from this little town called Lake Arthur. 
And I remember one time we went to the lake and I jumped in the water. Man, I'm just swimming up in that water and everything's cool. And I get out and I got leeches stuck to me. And I was like, ah! And I was like, I'm ripping them things off of me, man. And it stung when they came off. But dude, I got freaked out. I was like, get these things off of me, man. It's a little ugly, nasty thing. I mean, we wouldn't walk around with leeches stuck to us, would we? Right, right. I was thinking about that, you know what I'm saying? Wouldn't that be something if we could see sin like that? Oh, we had leeches stuck all up on our face. And man, that's so ugly. You know what I'm saying? Oh, it's going to hurt. Yeah, but look how ugly that is, dude. You need to get that off of there. You need to rip it off. You know, that would be something, and we'd be a whole lot more willing to get rid of it a lot more quickly, right? It's going to hurt when you pull it off. It is. Right. But you know what? You need to pull it off. You need to get it off of there. It's sucking the blood out of you. It's sucking the life out of you. Sin is going to try to take life away from you. What are the leeches in your life? The things that keep, let, that keep on hanging around, that you let hang around. Yeah, Come on, somebody. Yeah. Even though you know that they're stealing from you. The barren womb is lonely. It's kind of sad because during these times, a woman's only joy was in childbirth. And so a woman that, whose womb was barren and couldn't experience, she couldn't experience complete fulfillment. It's like an empty womb. You know what I'm saying? It's like an emptiness. It's like there's, it always seems like there's supposed to be more. It always seems like something's missing. There's a piece of the puzzle that always seems like it's missing. And no matter what she does, because her womb was meant to bear a child... She feels like she's empty. The earth is never satisfied with rain. Listen, I know in South Louisiana sometimes it doesn't <laughs> seem that way. But you let a few days go by with the hot baking sun and no rain, and you're going to see the earth is ready to drink again. <laughs> it's the same story, though, over and again, that no matter how much you get, it's too, it's, if it's too much of the wrong thing, it's still not going to be enough. The world it offers more than you can consume, but whatever it's offering is never going to satisfy you. See, that's what I'm talking about right now. The fact that we will try to satisfy ourselves with all kinds of things that aren't of the Lord. And sometimes it's not adultery or drugs or alcohol. Sometimes it's people or things or money. But whatever it is, if it's sin, it will never be enough. Right. Ma Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 says this. Jesus said this. He said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon was a, was a God that was money. It was the God of money, and people would worship that God. See, one scholar stated this, that what Jesus was saying here is that money is a great servant, but that it's a horrible master. That's right. That's right. Amen. It's a good servant. It's a good tool. It's nice to have some of that stuff in your pocket when you need to pay your bills. But when it becomes your master, it's a horrible master. See, you will know that money or something else has become your master rather than God when you choose more of it instead of more of God. You will know that thing has consumed your life when you think more about it than you think about God. Amen. Now it's an idol. Amen. An idol has gotten in between you and your God. Something stands in the way and it prevents you from being able to see God the way that you're supposed to see God. It doesn't matter what it is that you seek to fill the void in your soul. God created this world and he created it to sustain life so that it can sustain you. And me. But he didn't do all that just so that we could spend our lives focused on consumption. About finding something else. About trying to look for something else other than God. You know, I've learned that if you're not careful, you will keep searching for something to fill your empty spot. And you will go from one worldly thing to the next until you get to the end of your life and realize that you search for happiness and fulfillment in everything but the right thing. Amen. That's right. Amen. A drug addict will see a, seek another high until it leaves him sick and destitute. Then he may get sick enough to quit doing drugs, but the next thing you know, he'll try to fill a hole with something else and have woman after woman until he gets so hurt from that that he finally gets saved. But even then, he still doesn't learn to be content with Jesus, and so the search starts all over again. He's going to go get himself some education, and then he gets his education. He spends the next 10 to 15 years trying to be successful, and then one day he realizes that the success 
access, the education, couldn't fill the hole that the drugs couldn't fill, and that couldn't be filled by the women problem. And one day he's going to look up and the paint on his car is fading, and the new house that he built from the ground up doesn't smell new anymore. What I'm trying to tell you is it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't even matter if you're a believer today. If you're trying to seek and to search for something that's going to fill a hole in your heart, and it ain't the shape of Jesus, it's like trying to stick a, a circle in a square hole. Jesus is the only thing that's going to make you happy. I'm preaching to the preacher this morning. Help us, Lord. The whole time, day after day, year after year, Jesus was right there. The whole time we were doing all this. Jesus is right there. He got his nail scars, hands reached out, and he's saying, I'm just right here. I'm just one call away. I'm just, I'm still waiting, just waiting for you to call on me. I don't want to overtake you. I'll, I'll overtake you. I'll, I'll cause some sword to come on your land. I'll cause some trial and tribulation to come in your life. I'm just waiting you to, for you to call on me. And if you call on me, I'm right here. Just surrender to me. And I'll wrap you up in my loving arms, and you'll see those nail scarred hands in a spiritual way. And you'll know that I love you that I come. To heal you. He was ready to help. He was right there waiting for us to submit and to give in and say, Jesus, everything else leaves me empty. <clears throat> if I can't have anything else, but at least I have you, I will have everything I need. That's right. Yes. Oh, that's a good word. I know it's easier preached than it is received. I get it. <laughs> you think I ain't ever been there, man? This is the real world. But it's truth. It's the truth of the word of God. He's everything we need. That was point number one. You ain't never going to be satisfied with what the world's offering, right? Point number two, when your soul finds him, you found what you've really been yes, looking for. Lord. <laughs> psalm 103, verses 1 through 4. A psalm of David. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 4. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Our soul is who we are as individuals. This is kind of deep right here, so, so just work with me as I try to work through this little quick concept. Our soul is who we are as individuals. What I'm saying is, is that your soul is who you are. It's what makes Brendan Brendan. It's what makes Gowdy Gowdy, Robert Robert, Naya Naya. Your soul is who you are. You're a spirit being. In other words, you're never going to die. You're a spirit and you live inside of a body. Does that make sense? Right. Our soul is our inner man that connects our physical to our spiritual. Everything that your physical body has experienced has affected your soul. Listen, I don't I don't I just thought of this illustration this morning. Y'all seem to love Angie's illustration, so I figured I'd try. And it might fail because I really just thought about it this morning, but I don't think it will. Come Chari and Aaron, y'all come up here. I yeah. can I can trust y'all. Look, Aaron, Aaron, man, the family, the Lusto family's been going through a lot. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I said, hey, Aaron, I need, you to, I need you to come witness with me. He said, well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it or not, bro. And uh, so I saw him at the festival last night. And I snuck up on him. I stuck some tracks in his back pocket. And he ended up handing some out. And he prayed with some dude that we had already touched, man. And the Lord really did a good work. Come see over here, Chari. What I'm trying to say is this. Aaron is my physical body. He's my members. He's my arms. He's my eyes, my ears. You understand what I'm saying? He's the vessel. And Chari is the spirit man part of me. And I'm the soul. This is who I am. Now, when I'm over here, you can't really see who I am because you just see what's out here. But there's a whole lot going on on the inside of who I am. See, I can change my facial expression and make myself look happy, but you wouldn't really know that I'm sad. What I'm trying to say is, is that the way that you engage the physical world that you live in, it has an effect on your soul. All your years of living, all the music you listen to, all the friends you hung out with, all of the sin that you committed, all of the things that you did towards the Lord, it affected your soul. Listen, so what I'm trying to say is this, is that it's all interconnected. Yeah. If my flesh brings uh, brings sin into my life, 
then it affects my individuality. It affects my soul. And who I am now has affected the spirit part of me, which is the part that was created to know God and to love God. Hallelujah. But every time I took a little bit of sin, reach your hand out there and come do that like that, like you're grabbing a hold of a little bit of sin. It came into who I was and it affected this spirit part of me that was supposed to know the Lord and it died a little bit more. But then the next thing you know, you go ahead and reach your hand out there again. I grabbed a little bit of the word of the Lord. Yeah. Amen. I grabbed a little bit of the word of the Lord and I brought that in and it started to affect. And now it kind of caused a little bit of an awakening to the things of God that are supposed to be alive to the yes. Lord. And sometimes even like if you just press a button and you, and you turned it on the right radio station that was worshiping the Lord or talking yeah. about the Lord. It brought some things about God up into your soul, man, who, who you are, your individuality. It brought a little bit more life. Amen. To your spirit, man, that's coming alive to the Lord. I was thinking about this. Then you could kind of like interlock your fingers like this. Now, I know. I, my hands are kind of sweaty this morning. I don't normally sweat. Sorry about that. Come over here. All right. Now, now, Aaron, I want you to do this little thing where you kind of like, I know you're not much of a dancer, but I want you to act like you're kind of doing a dance move. Like that. Come on, dude. Come on, do it. Come on, do a little dance move. So what I'm trying to say is this, is that there's a flow going on over here. But you know, this is the beautiful thing about it. Whenever Aaron goes Go ahead and hit it again. He's bringing some, some God life up in there. It's flowing through me. It's getting up in my spirit. But guess what? Come on, Chari. You hit it the other way. Okay, now whip it out there. Look. Okay, y'all can go. Go ahead. Whip it out there. You see what I'm saying? Because God now is flowing back. The spirit man's coming alive to the things of God. And the next thing you know, God's now flowing back through who you are. And he's turning you into a vessel that's going to be used for the kingdom of God. Don't tell me it's not the Lord's will that we go out and tell people about Jesus. Don't tell me that it's not the Lord's will that we live for God in public. No, God wants to flow through us and he wants to let other people know that there's some hope out there. Amen. People are hurting and they're dying and they need some hope. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. When your hands exchanged money to buy sin in your nose or mouth or some other body part experienced sin, it affected your soul to the point that it brought some death to the spirit part of you that was meant to connect to God. John 4, 24 says this. God is a spirit. This is Jesus telling the Samaritan woman. God is a spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He created you. You're a spiritual being. Do you realize that you are going to live for eternity? I'm talking physical. Okay, your body's going to decay. Your body's going to die. If Jesus doesn't come back before you die, your body's going to die. It's going to go on the ground, ground and it's going to decay. God knows where it all is. He knows how to pull all that stuff up out the soil, even if they cremate you. Listen, I'm just saying, even if they ain't got the money to, get, to put you in a coffin and bury you, even if they have to cremate you, he knows how to put all them ashes together, man. He knows how to bring it, and you're going to have a glorified body one day. But what I'm trying to say is your physical body is going to die and it's going to decay. But your spirit, man, is going to live for an eternity. I'm talking about in a physical sense, even though you, get a, even though you may not have a body. I'm talking physically you're going to be alive, but you may be spiritually dead. That's the scary thing. Yeah. See, because your soul is who you are, and it's because you have a soul that you're going to be conscious of the fact that you're alive for eternity. See, that's why I'm not trying to get all up on this, but how the occult talks about new age system and all this other kind of stuff having to do with the occult. It's a lie. There was a song when I was young that said that we're all going to become part of the spirit in the sky. No, that's new age. That's that's Buddhism. That's uh, karma till we reach the place of dharma. You do good unto others until you finally re you keep doing karma, karma, karma. And you finally come back to this place where you hit dharma. And where you hit dharma is you all become part of the spirit in the sky. Lie. Amen. That's a satanic lie to make you think that you're not an individual. No, that's not the Lord. No, Christianity says you are who you are. God created you. He wonderfully and fearfully created you. Yes. Before you were in the, your mother's womb, he told Jeremiah, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. I had a plan for your life. That's right. God made you a spirit, amen, so that you have a relationship, amen, with him. I love the words that David writes that God wrote through King David because in his Psalms he seems to have a deep revelation of this thought where he speaks to his own soul. I know I've said that before, but it's so encouraging to me. Because yeah. you know, like, I don't know, I get fired up, man. I mean, 
I'm telling you right now, and, and when I play football and sports and stuff like that, man, I was the kind of guy, man, I, look, I know everybody's not like this, and it's, I've had to learn the hard way. I respond a whole lot better to a kick in the backside or a shake of my face mask or a slap in the helmet. I responded a whole lot better to that than I did just a pat on the butt. And, you know, but, but the point that I'm trying to, so I get excited whenever people, that's just me, not everybody's like that. But, but I get excited whenever people like talk and, and, and encouragement and, 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 you know, and, and try to push and try to say, hey, man, the Lord, amen, is going to get us through this thing. That's kind of what yeah. David does to himself. Yeah, he does. Yeah. So listen, this is point number two. We're yeah. reminding you when your soul finds him, you found what you've really been looking yeah. for. Yes. But look at this out of this Psalm 103, verse 1. I wanted to tell you this. This is a sub point. I want you to bless him. I want to encourage you this morning to bless him. You know why? Point number one, sub point number one, because he's worthy. Amen. Bless him because he's worthy. Yes. Amen. Yes. Psalm 103, 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. I talked all that stuff about the soul just to give you the revelation that your soul is who you are. And I'm just seeing David over here saying, come on, you deep down in there that has heard of God and known of God and loves God, you better bless him. Amen. All that is within me, you better bless his holy name. It's time for you to line up with the word of God. It's time for you to line up with the will of God. God has made himself known to you and he's allowed his word to be spoken to you and you've heard his word and there comes a time when you, yourself, your soul, your individuality has to surrender to the will of God. Come on, soul. Amen. Amen. Yes. <coughs> oh no, you don't understand what I'm trying to say. Every last part of you is needs to surrender to God. Part. I'm preaching yes. to the preacher right now. I ain't yes, even preaching Lord. to you. I'm talking to my own soul right now. Every last part of you is supposed to surrender to God. You're supposed to hold on to the leech, whatever the leech may be in your life. No. They trying to suck the life out of you, man. You got to let go of that thing. You in there that have rebelled and searched for something other than the Lord. Yes, you right now, even you, you're going to bless his holy name because he's bigger than you. Because he's the God of glory and he created the universe and he created all of this so that you and I could be sustained with life. Why? So that we could glorify him. Bless him because he's worthy. Hallelujah. You need a revelation this morning that God's worthy. He's bigger than your problem. He's bigger than the people at work that get on your nerves. He's bigger than the people in your family that get on your nerves. Man, you got to start acting right. Holy Spirit, change us. Change us deep down on the inside. Yes, yes. Holy Spirit, speak to our soul. Yes, Cause us to rise up yes. and to be hungry for your will. Amen. Yes. Bless him because he's worthy. But look, point number two, I'm just going to be real with you. Bless him because he has benefits. Yes. He got a benefit package, man. The Lord has a benefit package. Yes. I'm not in this for selfishness, but I'm telling you right now, I guarantee you I could get at least five people, well, at least some people up here to start giving a testimony. Yeah. Right now, I could get yeah. some people up in here to start giving a testimony about where they were uh, before and where they are now. Uh, yeah. And they wasn't looking to serve the Lord just because of his benefit package. Right, right. But as they focused on the Lord, as they walked towards him or ran towards him, guess what happened? And next thing you know, all kind of prosperity started flowing yeah. in their life. All kind of benefits yeah. started flowing in their life. Come on, somebody. Yeah. I'm looking at some of y'all up in here and I know your story. And I know that the Lord has done a work in your life. Amen. 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 He wants to prosper his people. Amen. Amen. Why? Because he wants you to turn around and live your life for him. That's right. I was sharing with Troy the other night, and I know I've shared it with y'all before, but when the children of Israel left Egypt, God told the Egyptians, you're going to give them your stuff. <laughs> but you know what they did with that stuff? Y'all remember? <clears throat> they built the tabernacle with it. And I remember when I read that one time, the Lord said, I've blessed you, but your <laughs> prosperity is not for your pleasure, it's for my purpose. Wow. Yeah. You know, God wants to bless us, but a big part of the reason he's wanting to bless us is that we turn around and bless his kingdom. That's right. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. If we can't let go of that, some of that stuff, yes. <laughs> now it has become mammon in our life. It's become the idol. It stands between us and the Lord. That's another message. Yes. I'll let the Lord deal with you on that. <laughs> but look at this. This is... Sub point number two, bless him because he has benefits. Sub point, point, 
one of under point two is one, Psalm 103 verse 3a. Look at this. He forgives all your iniquities. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says this. But God commends his love toward us and not while we were yet sinners. Yes. Christ died for us. You know what the word commended means? The idea there, it means the idea of binding together and to stand with. While I was a sinner, while I was my worst, that's when Jesus, this is how I see it anyway, that's when Jesus came to earth for the purpose of dying for Matt A. Bear. It took me a long time to get a revelation of this, and y'all wouldn't have wanted to see me. I was so dumb. I know I tell y'all this. I, I, like, I know I talk about how I had that long hair. Y'all remember, remember Mike Tyson? Look, I'm going to try to tell you how dumb yeah. I was. <laughs> and dude, I thought I was the coolest cat. <laughs> Wait till y'all hear this. Y'all ready? I'm going to say it on the video. You don't even have to cut this out. I don't know people know how dumb I was. <laughs> Mike Tyson come, <laughs> come out in the ring one time where he cut a hole in his towel. And he had that towel, and all it was was a towel that covered his front and his back. I started walking around towel. <laughs> my mom said, wait, no, you ain't ready. I had my old football shorts from when I was a kid, cut them things, turned them into shorts. Had that towel draped over my long hair. I'm like, dude, this is how I roll, bro. And I thought that was cool. I don't even know why I got on that. I'm going to tell you why I got on that. Because Jesus was willing to stand with me. Yeah. Yes. As silly as I look, as goofy as I was, Jesus wasn't ashamed of me. While I was yet a sinner, he died for the ungodly. While I was yet way out of the way and looking ridiculous, he still was willing to stand with me. And so I'm going to go to the festival, and I'm going to try to hit somebody a track, and they're going to look at me like I'm dumb, and I'm going to let that cause me to crawl up in a corner whenever Jesus was willing to stand with me. It's not me that they're looking at like I'm dumb, and they're like trying to look at my Jesus like he's dumb. No, you don't get it, sir. Ma'am. Jesus died for me, but he died for you. And you can look at him dumb all you want to, but I'm here to tell you, you need to read this thing I asked you to stick in your pocket because one day, life's going to get the better of you. You acting all hard and tough back there, sir. Uh, Mr. Pol police officer. You can look at <laughs> Mr. Police officer, you're so cool. Looking down on me. But let me tell you something, sir. I know good and well everything ain't right at your house. How do I, how you know you judge me? No, because ain't no nothing right at nobody's house. Because we live on a fallen earth and everything's messed up. And that's why God had to send the most precious thing in heaven, Jesus, to die on a cross to set us free. And you over there acting like you got it all together. Come on. And then that one lady that handed it to you. You ever felt like you didn't have hope, man? One time I felt like I didn't have... I ain't never felt that way, but I read it. You lie. <laughs> <laughs> ain't never felt hopeless. Oh, wow. Welcome to the world, you know. The one person who's never felt hopeless. <laughs> People are ridiculous, huh? Lord help us. I'm over here making fun. It's not funny, but y'all get that's right. Lord, help us. Help the people. Yes. Help them. Yes. Help them. Break through that exterior. Yes. Get deep down inside of that heart. Start dealing with them, Lord, like you did for us. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Amen. All right, I'm almost done. Y'all bear with me. See, he's willing to stand with us and stand by our side, so don't let us be ashamed of him. Amen? Right. See, when, he, when you find him, guess what you're going to realize? He was what you needed the whole time. That's what we are. We're still on point number two. We're about to wrap it up. Got two, a couple more scriptures for you. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. That's what it says right there. For both he that sanctifies, talking about God, and they who are sanctified are all one, for which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. He's one. When you Listen, the gospel teaches this, that when you were born the first time, you were born like Adam in sin. Get that? Sin separates man from God. God sent Jesus to die on the cross so that sinful man could be brought back to God. To be made one with God. See, when you became one with him when he died on the cross, and you became, this is Romans chapter 6. We're not going to go there, but I'm just telling you. You became one with him when, you, when he died on the cross. The day you put faith in Christ and the mind of God, you became one with Jesus on the cross. You became one with Jesus in his death. And you became one with Jesus in his resurrection. You're a new creature in Christ. Amen. 
You become one with him. He's not ashamed to call you his brother. Thank you, Lord. You're part of his flesh. <sighs> yes. You're not going to hurt your own flesh, are you? That's another message for another. <laughs> Help us. He's not ashamed because he died to make us clean. All right, Psalm 103, 3, sub point number 3, <laughs> part B of 103, <laughs> who healeth all your diseases. You're serving because he's got benefits. Number one, he heals you of your iniquities. Number two, he wants to heal you of your disease. Listen, all your sin from all your, it's affected your past. All that sin that has affected and stricken your emotions with disease and has stricken your mind with corrupted thought. God wants to heal you of all of that stuff. Yeah, amen. amen. Yes. Sometimes you, you wonder, man, am I ever going to get better? Am I ever going to be the same? Am I ever going to think some pure thoughts. The Word of God tells me I'm supposed to think pure thoughts. And all I find myself thinking is bad thoughts. The Lord heals your disease. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we can preach on physical healing because He'll still heal your physical body. But I'm here to tell you this morning, most of the malady that we uh, deal with has to do with our emotions and our thinking and, the and, and what sin has done to us. Lord, I pray that you'd wipe all that stuff out and that you'd cause a... You know what we need? We need a good spiritual uh, defibrillator. <laughs> I mean, that's what you do. I mean, whenever somebody... I know I'm in medicine. I'm a nurse <laughs> practitioner too. But listen, I used to be an ICU nurse. When somebody goes into ventricular fibrillation, they're in a heart rhythm that's just quivering and it doesn't sustain life. When you bound up in sin, when you all thinking all you're thinking about is sin, that's not going to sustain spiritual life. Whenever you hit somebody, shot, clear, boom! It kills them for a second, boom, and then the heart starts up with a better rhythm. That's what we need. We need a spiritual defibrillation. Lord, we need you to move all that stuff out of our life, amen? And we need you to give us new life. We need you to give us new thought. We need the Holy Spirit to do that. Do you get that? You ain't going to make yourself think good thoughts. You know how long, how many times I tried to do that? <laughs> like, Lord, and listen, one time when I first got saved, I told the preacher, I said, man, I'm in the pipe yard and I ain't thinking about nothing but all these things. And you know how the devil will do? He'll, he'll and it's not funny, but he'll twist it. You'll have like a bad memory. Like, I'm just saying something lustful, okay? Is it, can I be real with you this morning? You have like this lustful thought, then the devil will embellish it. Yeah. He'll make it like, oh, it was all this and like build upon it. And oh, man, oh, yeah. That was, oh, yeah, I remember that. Boy, that was so, it wasn't even like that. It wasn't, I mean, I'm not, you know, you give a point. And like you over, I'm over here in the pipe yard trying to like spread pipe dope, and I'm just thinking about all these past things, and it's like, man, I'm just being tore up with it. And I know my brain ain't supposed to think like that. And I go to the preacher, and I'm like, what am I do? And, and the preacher said, and they meant, well, just pray in the spirit more. So I'm over there trying to pray in the spirit, and guess what? No, let me tell you something. Jesus died to break the bondage of your thought life. I'm here to tell you that this morning. Jesus already did the work. He said it is finished. Amen. And if you'll trust him and believe him, That's right. he will allow the grace of the Holy Spirit to flow in that area of your life. Amen. The Holy Spirit will begin to give you new desires in your heart. He'll begin to give you new thoughts in your head. He'll begin to strengthen you and encourage you and give you hind's feet. You know what a hind's feet is, huh? It's like what a ram has. You ever seen a ram climb up on rocks? Right, right. You, 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 he, he, he's, it's stability. Even in rocky surfaces, even on a surface that looks like it's about to crumble. No, he gives you hind feet yeah. so that you can stand yeah. even in the worst Hallelujah. of times. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm closing with these two scriptures. Look at Philippians 4, 11 through 13. I'm talking about being content in Jesus. Amen. Whatever the word is that was spoken to you, there's a piece of this word this morning that spoke to your heart. The Lord's going to let you remember it through the week. But look what the Apostle Paul says as he's in prison and he writes this letter to the church in Philippi. He says, not that I speak in respect of want. In other words, I don't really need anything right now, but I'm just letting you know. He said this, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. The only way you can be content like that is if you get a revelation of Jesus. He says, I know how both to be abased. In other words, with nothing. And I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things. How are you going to do that, Paul? Yes. I can do all things. 
things through Christ who strengthens me. You're not going to do it in your own strength, folks. Amen. Last scripture right here, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Naya, could you come to the front and play us a song? Amen. We're going to close out in worship. Maybe also this morning you might need prayer for something. I just want you to know we're here, amen, to pray for you. Anything that you might have need of. If not, we're just going to go out worshiping the Lord. Amen. amen. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation. <clears throat> He's not talking about you having a talk with somebody. He's talking about the way you live your life. That's old King James. <clears throat> For the way you live your life. Let your lifestyle be without covetousness. You know what that means? Don't be walking around here every day on this earth looking for something else to fill the hole in your heart. He says, let your lifestyle be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said this, I will never leave you. Or forsake you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's never going to leave you or forsake you, church. Praise God. Let's worship the Lord. Yes.